Good morning. Welcome to the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by the Kraft Analytics Group. My name is Matt Kilby. I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. It is my pleasure to bring to you our presentation, The Biggest Comebacks and Collapses in Golf. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Mark Brody from Columbia Business School to the stage. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me to talk about golf analytics, and thank you all for coming out uh, early this morning to listen to a talk about comebacks in, in golf. So what do I mean by comeback? Typically refers to a come from behind victory. Why do we care about these comebacks? Because big comebacks represent sustained great performance under pressure. They're associated with really exciting and memorable uh, events. And so we wanted to sort of measure what are the biggest comebacks in golf, and maybe an example of this might be the 1960 US Open won by Arnold Palmer when he started the final round seven strokes behind the leaders, and there's 14 players between uh, him and the leader, and he came from behind to win, and these and some other Arnold Palmer comebacks led to the term the, uh, the Palmer charge. Uh, so how do you measure a comeback? This is an example of a leaderboard before the tournament is, is finished, and you want to figure, well, what would be a bigger, bigger comeback? Uh, player F, who's uh, at three under par and is five strokes out of the lead, but has a certain number of players to beat, or some other leaderboard where a player is five strokes behind but only has one player in, in front of them. All of these factors matter in measuring a comeback. How many strokes behind are you? But that's not the only factor. How many players are between you and the leader matters. So you could be two strokes behind with 10 players in between you, and that might be more difficult than if you're three or four strokes behind and nobody's in between you and the leader. So we also look at how many holes are remaining, different player skills, and how difficult the holes are. And so how do you put all of those different factors into one measure of difficulty of winning, and that's what win probability does. So I wanted to define what win probability means in the context of, of a co competition, in this case of a golf event. So the win probability of a single player in a point in time is the likelihood of the player winning the event. So here I have a path in blue that at time 80, the player has a 70% chance of winning the event. That's the 70% win probability. And what do I mean by that? If you could run the event forward multiple times, the player would win seven out of 10 of those times starting in those same circumstances. The problem is that's sort of a hypothetical or theoretical exercise. You can't rerun the event multiple times from that exact situation, so we need to estimate these probabilities mathematically, but at least as a conceptual foundation, uh, a 70% win probability would mean that from that particular point in time, in that situation, if you could run the future over and over again, the player would win 70% of the time, or seven out of 10 future scenarios. So we do this using a mathematical model that comes from, at the foundation, a whole score model. And what is a whole score model? It's, uh, just go through this example here. Tiger Woods is playing hole 71 of a 72 hole event we need to specify what's the likelihood of Tiger Woods shooting a two, three, four, five, or six, and what are those whole score probabilities. And so we do that for every player at every point in time for every possible score. We have these whole score probabilities. We then simulate golf events over and over again to come up with win probabilities out of this whole score model. So how do we know we have a reasonable win probability model? Well, we want to make sure that it's unbiased, that whenever we say a player has a 63% chance of winning, that over all the events that we looked at where we made that forecast, 63% of the time the player wins. So that's saying that our predictions compared to the actual would lie on a 45 degree line, and they, they do. And we put these win probability models uh, through a number of other tests, and we sort of conclude that is really you know, quite, quite accurate. So now we can take a look at ranking comebacks in golf. And if we look at the beginning of round four and say, 
which winner of the event had the lowest win probability at the beginning of round four. And let's rank the, the events from 2005 to 2020 in terms of lowest win probability at the beginning of round four. And the, the top event that, that pops up is Tommy Ganey in 2012 won the McGladry Classic and we thought he had a 0.1% chance of winning. So you might not be so familiar with win probabilities and how does that translate into golf intuition? What does a 0.1% win probability mean and why did this end up at the top of our list of uh, beginning of round four comebacks? Well, at the beginning of the round, Tommy Ganey was seven shots behind the lead. So how, how likely is that happening? to happen. Well, in 2012, there were four other winners that started seven or more shots behind the lead. So it doesn't seem that remarkable if in 40 events, uh, four of them have, have a property being seven or more shots behind the lead. But in addition to being seven shots behind the lead, Tommy Ganey at the beginning of round four was tied for 29th place with 11 other players. He was one shot out of 41st place. <laughs> so he had not only a big stroke deficit, but a big number of players to beat in order to, to win. He shot a 10 under par in the final round to, to win by one shot. He finished so early because he was so far behind when he started that the final group, the leaders at the time, were playing the eighth hole when he, when he finished. So this was quite a remarkable comeback. But I don't want to just look at the beginning of round four. So let's take a look at some other sports, in this case football, and how do other sports rank comebacks? And this is from uh, NFL operations that ranked the likelihood of comebacks in NFL games for the last um, uh, decade, I think. And the number one comeback there was the Philadelphia Eagles and the New York Giants that in the middle of the fourth quarter uh, the Eagles came back from one in 252 odds of, of victory. So quite a, quite a remarkable comeback, but you look further down the list and you'll see a couple that are tied for the lead there at 0.7%, uh, five and six on the list. They both had, both of those games, the eventual winner had a 0.7% chance of going on to victory, but one had eight minutes and 30 seconds remaining and the other had about a minute and a half remaining. And you wanna say, are those two equivalent? So they, should they be right next to each other on the list? Turning this back into golf, which do you think would be more impressive, coming back from a 5% win probability with three holes to go or a 5% win probability with 15 holes to go? So I asked a bunch of my golfing friends about this and they said, well, yeah, well, three holes to go, that's gotta be more impressive. Yeah, but it's 5% in both cases. So which is it? Is it the same or is it, is it different? And I claim it's different. I claim it's different because uh, here, if you take a look at this win probability path, you can see the minimum is around time 93. And I don't think that's as impressive because it's gotta go from about 30% to 100%, but it's got a lot longer time to do it than at time 98 going from 41%. It's a much steeper slope. You have to go from that level to 100%. You have to uh, make up all this win probability in a shorter period of time, which seems more difficult. But now how do you sort of reconcile those two? And this is the way we reconcile those two. We take a look at many, many events, take a look at the winners, and this is the median win probability path of a winner in a golf event goes from about 30% at time 90 to 100% at time 100. So I'm, I'm dividing time up into the first round is zero to 25, second round is 25 to 50, third round 50 to 75, and the fourth round is 75 to 100. So this is a typical win probability path. What's not so typical would be to be at 30% at time 99. We're conditioning on knowing the winner we know if you're at 30% at time 90 and you win, you're gonna sort of march up toward 100 and it's very unlikely that you're gonna be at time 99 still at a 30% win probability. Those are not equivalent events. So if instead of just looking at the median, we also look at the 25th percentile and the 5th percentile win probabilities across time, the lowest curve there is a 5% win probability curve. It's where 
only 5% of the wind probability paths are ever below that curve at a fixed point in time. The other 95% are above. So that, that lowest wind probability curve is 5 percentile of all of the wind probability paths that end in a wind. So it's very unlikely to be close to zero with little time remaining. It's much more likely to be close to, to zero with a lot of time remaining. Another way to think, see this, if we looked across the entire golf event, most winners have less than a 1% win probability when they tee off hole one. If you have 150 players and they were equally skilled, they would have a one in 150 chance of winning. You wouldn't say, wow, what a great comeback because this player won, because every week a player that has less than a 1% chance of winning wins the event, unless it's Roy McIlroy, one of the stars. So it doesn't make sense in the context of golf to take a look at the lowest win probability going to 100% without taking into account time. The way we take into account time is by looking at these quantiles. So we look at a win probability path and we see what is the lowest quantile curve that it touches and that's how we rank comebacks. Okay? What's the lowest quantile curve ever hit by the win probability path of a winner to take into account this time phenomenon? Now we can rank events, not just at the beginning of round four, but throughout the, throughout the tournament. Again, we looked at events from 20, 2005 to 2020, and the top two were Kevin Streelman winning the Travelers and Justin Rose winning the WGC HSBC tournament. So why is that number one? Well, just again, going back to some golf intuition, the 2014 Travelers, Streelman shot 28 on the back nine, he finished with seven straight birdies. And his comeback, we also say, when, you know, when did that comeback start? It was with an hour and 15 minutes left in, in the event. The bottom, you can see what was his score to par. The top, you look at the, the win probability of Kevin Streelman there in red, and also his nearest competitors, uh, Sergio Garcia and KJ Choi. And you can see how his win probability at 425 is about zero and it goes up to about 100, but he started his birdie run before 425. A lot of those initial birdies didn't lead to a lot of uh, increase in, in win probability. But this was sort of a, uh, a remarkable uh, comeback when we take you know, the time into consideration. Okay, well here's another comeback that wasn't you know, the top five on the list, but it was still pretty, pretty high up. It was in the top 5% of comebacks. Again, measured by this minimum quantile curve ever hit. So Paul Casey, you could see at one o'clock he was close to zero. Um, it turns out that, you know, if we rank this comeback, it would be at, you know, 30% just before five o'clock and he went to 100 at, that, uh, at the end because he won, okay? Well, how, how amazing was, was this comeback? Well, if we take a look at what was going on throughout the event, not just his win probability curve and, and others, but what was he doing? Well, Paul Casey birdied a lot of holes from, say, 1 o'clock to uh, 3.30. He parred in from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He parred in uh, and finished at 4 at 4.54, and he was tied for the lead. The, the, the event didn't happen, didn't end until an hour later. So he finished, his win probability was 30%. An hour later, he wins. So he's in the clubhouse waiting for everybody to finish. He was tied for the lead at the time he went into the clubhouse with a 30% win probability. His win probability went up to 100% doing nothing other than waiting in the clubhouse. Would you want to rank this as one of the most remarkable comebacks and put it in the top 5% of comebacks of, of, uh, of all time? And the answer is probably not. So what's different about golf? It's a multiplayer event. In two team sports, if you go from 30% to 100%, you're banging on the other team and doing a lot of good or they're doing a lot of bad. Here you can go from 30 to 100% doing nothing which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So how do we take that into account? We define a new measure called a surge. 
a surge is going to be an increase in wind probability due to the player's own play. So from one hole to the next, there's a wind probability change. It can go up, it can go down. We're gonna decompose that into the wind probability change due to what the player did and a wind probability due to what everybody else did. So Paul Casey, who had finished, his wind probability is going up even though he's doing nothing, so the wind probability due to Paul Casey when he's finished is zero. All of the wind probability is due to what, what's happening to the other players that are out on the course. But we can also measure this during the event when there's a bunch of players out on the course. If player A birdies the hole and player B pars, and these are the top two uh, that are likely to, to win, the win probability change due to the player could be 5%. Due to the others, it could be zero. So birdie you know, means a lot in terms of win probability. The par doesn't mean a whole lot. But you can also have a case where player A birdies the hole, and that would contribute to a 6% increase in win probability if nothing else changed. But if player B also birdies, that brings the win probability back minus 6%. So you birdie, the other player birdies, your win probability hasn't changed, but you get credit for the birdie in terms of a 6% is what would have happened just due to you, and the minus 6% is because others also match that. So you're like climbing up a hill, your birdie is climbing up a hill, and then you start sliding back a little bit when other players play well also. And of course, you could have a big win probability change if a player birdies the hole and the other player bogeys. You could get um, a win probability where player A bogeys, he goes backwards 8%, player B birdies, and they go backwards another 7%. So you could lose 15%, but only 8% is due to the player's bogey. So our method of ranking surges is to sum the win probability changes due to the player himself or herself over the remaining holes. And when we do that, the top two surges were Henrik Stenson at the Open Championship in 2016 and Roy McIlroy at the Arnold Palmer Invitational at 28, in 2018. So, the Open Championship, their surge started, or Henrik Stenson surge started at time 92, which was three hours and 40 minutes left in the tournament. So we, time 75 is when the first player goes off in round four, the leaders go off, go off later. So there's about three and a half hours left uh, when Stenson surge started. So why does this rank number one on the list or tied for number one? Because there is this great duel between Stenson and Mickelson, and every time Stenson birdied, you know, Mickelson would also birdie, and so you had this great, you know, comeback due to Stenson's own play, but then falling a little bit back because of Mickelson's play. This is what it looked like. The, the nearest competitor besides these two was J.B. Holmes, and you could see it was many strokes off the lead, never had a chance of winning. It was a duel between uh, Stenson and, and Mickelson, and you can see Stenson, their win probability, Stenson's win probability stayed at around 50% for most of the event until the last few holes when he, when he pulled away. But he gets a lot of credit for all those birdies that were matched by Mickelson's birdies. So his uh, surge was tied for the largest surge that we found between 2000 and 2005. And it was because of the way we're measuring surges and taking into account not only what a player does, but measuring that relative to what other players do. Another interesting surge and tied for the lead was Roy McIlroy winning the 2018 Arnold Palmer uh, Invitational at, at Bay Hill. At the beginning of the round, McIlroy was 10 under par, two shots out of the lead, and he was behind, again, Henrik Stenson and Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, his surge didn't start until 5-10, so he needed some, some birdies in order to get enough win probability for it to matter. So if you're way out of the lead and you start burning a couple of holes, your win probability might go from 1% to 2% to 3%. It really starts putting you under pressure when you have a realistic chance of winning. And that was about 5-10 when McElroy was on the 12th hole at 13 under par. He birdied five of the next holes uh, to finish it at 18 under par and he won at, at 640. So you can see the win probability of the winner McElroy 
in red, and down below you can see uh, the player's score uh, to par as they went through, uh, through this event. So we talked about comebacks and surges in golf. The reason that we're interested is that comebacks represent this great, uh, sustained great performance under pressure. It's fine to measure events at a fixed time and see what was the lowest win probability uh, that, that uh, ended up in a victory for, for a player. But that doesn't make sense if you want to look at the minimum across time, and that's where we ranked events across time by looking at the minimum win probability quantile curve that's, that's hit. The issue with, with that is it doesn't differentiate how much of those win probability changes are due to the player and how much are due to others. So for that, for these multiplayer events, we came up with this notion of a surge to focus on the player's own contribution to their win probability changes and that led to the, uh, the Henrik Stenson and the Roy McIlroy event. So there's different ways to measure comebacks, but I think they all lead to sort of interesting stories about you know, the historically great uh, comebacks of all time in golf. So with that, I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Yes? So the short answer is I don't. This is just within sort of uh, with, within each event. So one way to handle that is to, to rank majors separately. So the pressure that a player feels could be very different across players. And certainly there's, there's a bigger pressure in the player, in, in, in majors, maybe the players, and, and, and some other events. But that's a little bit harder to, to quantify. And so the short answer is I don't. <laughs> I don't quantify that, but uh, that's something that's outside the model that you certainly want, would want to take a look at. And because um, the Open Championship was ranked number one, uh, I didn't put up a, a separate list for majors, but I do have a separate list for majors. Yes? There was a tournament where Snedeker, the weather was really bad, he shot 67, everybody else shot like 75 or, or higher. So would the model give him credit for that? Or because all the leaders, everyone around him is just making bogeys, would it, would it somehow take away from his performance? No, he would certainly get credit for that. Um, but I have to go back and look where, where does he fall on the list. I just, he wasn't in the top five, so I didn't, uh, didn't know that. But that's one that I will look up because uh, I put this out on Twitter last night and a couple people mentioned that, uh, that exact event. So I will take a look. And I imagine it's high up there, but I'm not sure how high. Yes? Uh, would you consider a significant change in the probability outcome if you consider the other players, like world ranking, for example, it's more impressive if you overtake some of the better players as opposed to older players? That we absolutely do take into account. And our whole score model, one big component is player skill. So if uh, you're in the same position in terms of strokes behind and players behind, but in front of you are Tiger Woods, Roy McIlroy, whatever, and you are Tommy Ganey, then that's going to be ranked as a bigger comeback than Tiger Woods in that position trying to overtake no-name player one and no-name player two and no-name player three. So uh, our player skill model directly takes that into account. Yeah. list uh, were all like 2018 to 2020. Um, is there anything about the way players play now? Do they have, you know, a larger standard deviation in terms of, of their scores that, that would lend itself to, uh, uh, oh, I didn't see 2010. I actually thought that said uh, 2020. Okay. Yeah. So there, were, there was one 2010 there, but uh, we went from 2005 to 2020. I haven't looked at how has this changed uh, over time, but I do plan to do like yearly ranking, so you can see, you know, one year versus versus the other. Um, I think it's just in this case a little bit of luck that we didn't see a 2004 or five up here. Oops. Great. Maybe. Yes. Um, so you mentioned everybody starts with 
Less than a, a 1% probability? No, I'm saying uh, except for, say, the top 10 in the world, the Roy right. McRoy's, whatever, right. if they have a 5 or 10%, then that takes away from others. So if one of the top okay. 10 players in the world uh, doesn't win, typically a player will start with less than a 1% win probability. Right. Okay. Yep. Which also gets to your point that the player skill is, is taken in, into account. Yes? For skill, what, what is the baseline? Is that uh, world golf ranking or scoring average wins? How do you... Uh... I use strokes gained and strokes gained, but not only taking into account um, your performance against the field, but how strong the field is. So it's uh, very similar to strokes gained that you would see on the PGA Tour website, but I also take into account the strength of the field. But it is a, a strokes gained measure of skill, not a world ranking measure of skill. One last one, yep. Have you ever looked at like expiration, like the, maybe like the total area that you are below the 50th percentile curve or something to see like, you know, you could imagine someone being like, I have no chance at this thing and then mounting a comeback. That, that's an interesting idea and we have not looked at that, but some other things that we've looked at um, are sort of uh, win probability whipsaws, looking at a player whose win probability is very high, then it goes way down because they bogey, but yet they overcome that and then come back up. So we're looking at these, these win probability whipsaws. We're also looking at measuring drama in, in events. So which one has the most excitement or the most uncertainty about who's going to win for, for the longest time? So you can do a lot more with this win probability analysis. Uh, area under the curve is one that I hadn't think, thought of, but looking at drama and looking at whipsaws and also looking at collapses or, or others. So we look at both uh, uh, comebacks and collapses and the equivalent here, surges and stumbles. Uh, so we have a lot of other things we can do, but in the time, this was uh, all I had time to present. Great. Thank you very much.